So my name is Susan Helfter, and my primary responsibilities here at USC are as the Director of Outreach Programs for the School of Music, as well as I'm on the music education faculty in that department, teaching classes, um, advising dissertations and thesis and research projects, um, and teaching a couple classes in that area. So it's really a combined effort that, uh, that I do here. I'm also the um, co-director of the Midori Center for Community Engagement, so another community-oriented um, program that, that the school of music has embraced. I, uh, my main instrument is the French horn. I started off playing the French horn and the piano and um, I, I got a master's degree in horn performance here at USC and at that time when I, when I was finishing that degree there were just so many things that interested me, it interested me as far as what's the next step, what am I going to do next and as y one of the, the main ideas that people have as success as it being an orchestral musician is so you're going to get an orchestra job and live happily ever after. And um, so I started to take orchestral auditions <clears throat> and as I got closer and closer to actually getting an orchestral job I was able to see much more clearly what that life would really be like because from so far away, it's really hard to get a good sense of what that would be. But once I got close enough to it, I actually took a good hard look at it and realized that that might not even be what, what I would find fulfilling or completely fulfilling. So, and that is, of course, if I ever won an audition in the first place. So, uh, so there are all those factors in place. And, and I just started to think, if, it, if this isn't what my goal is, having a little better perspective, then what is? You know, then what would be, if I could create the best job in the world for me, what would that look like? And so at that point, I, I sort of defined what that would be for me and then, and then set a new course to, to achieve it. Um, and so, it, I mean, there, there's a lot that went on in that decision because as soon as you, you embrace a little bit more music education than performance, people's impression is automatically that, you're, that you can't play. And so I, I knew that going in. I, I knew if I embraced music education that that's what would happen. And I just decided that if that's an outside perception of, of somebody else, then, then I can't do anything about that anyway. So, of course, I'm still the same person. And uh, it's just that there are more things that I, that I really enjoy that really motivate me and, and really interest me. So now I'm able to do a broader range of things. Like so many other subjects, music is absolutely one of the, the essential areas that, that anybody needs to have. I, I, education in the arts, I'll speak about specifically music, but just to provide provide some, uh, some ideas, some goals, some uh, music, instruction in music can provide more opportunities for students that they would not otherwise have, ways of engaging with their own education, ways of engaging with other people around them, um, and particularly for students who learn in different ways. I mean, we, we can certainly look at the, at the multiple intelligences theory of Howard Gardner, that people learn in different ways as well as we have different quotients of, of intelligence in many different areas. Areas. And to not educate, particularly in music or any of the arts, is really to not completely educate a human. And if, if, and if our goal is to have the self-realized, educated uh, citizens, then we cannot ignore that, just as we cannot ignore uh, the other subjects that really contribute to, uh, to a well-rounded well person with goals and ambitions and, and, and to really be the best person that they can be at whatever they choose to do ultimately. It's absolutely not about creating another whole crop of professional musicians. It's about contributing to the, the knowledge and con contributing to just the being of who, who the children are as they grow up into adulthood. My role as a director of outreach programs gives me the opportunity to combine the services and the opportunities that are available at USC through our students, through our faculty, and combine them with many of the needs that are in existence in the community immediately around us, and to put these two together. And it's a constantly changing landscape because, of course, our student body is changing all the time. And so, therefore, our ability to offer and to deliver different programming changes every semester, uh, while at the same time, considering that in the community, um, many students and parents um, expect a lot of fluctuation, and not in a good way. They expect people to offer programs that are only in existence for six months, ten months, and then that program will all of a sudden fold, and those opportunities will no longer be available. So we're playing into that 
uh, that assumption on the part of the community and trying to provide in, as, in as the best way we can a consistent um, musical opportunity for the for students in the community we one of our first goals is to help the music educators that are in the schools immediately around USC. USC as a university has identified the family of schools, which are the schools in the geographic area immediately around USC. And those are the schools that we are charged with serving. And so um, I meet with regularly with the principals and music teachers and find out what do you need? What can we do for you? Um, and where there are music programs, we help them. It, it, sometimes it's assisting a band director. Or if the band director is a brass player, then I try to send them some woodwind players to help out the beginning woodwind kids, that kind of thing. And, and if sometimes it's providing um, performances so that the young students in the community can hear a model up close in their very own band room um, of what, what fantastic tone on any given instrument or any singer would be. So to support the music programs that are in existence, and, and there are plenty of opportunities where there either aren't music programs or the music teachers are just unable to, to reach all of the students in the school because they're there, the music teacher's there for one day a week and there are a thousand kids in the school. So they have to pick and choose who they're going to teach, and then all of the other children in those schools don't have music education through their regular school. So in those circumstances, we try to find uh, the best way to um, help those kids in the school. If they're going to start fourth grade violin, can we provide something for them while they're in the second and third grade to get them ready for that? That kind of thing. Or if there's a high school jazz ensemble, can we help those middle school kids in a jazz ensemble get ready to participate in the high school? So to provide ongoing instruction like that where it's not possible. Um, we also provide individual uh, events. Sometimes we have a, a guest performance in a school that will come in for a one, a one evening or a one afternoon thing. Or we put on workshops here at USC. Um, we've had drum day for the last few years um, that includes our faculty, uh, three, fa three percussion faculty or drum faculty, and they do a one hour clinic um, each with three hours of, of workshop day. And it's, in, in, it's open to anybody in the community who would like to come. But how neat is it to hear um, Peter Ur Erskine talk about beginning drumming techniques, or to hear Ndugu Chancellor talk about, you know, uh, any kind of backbeat drumming, or, and to hear it live. Um, it's just an opportunity that our community doesn't have. And what's interesting to me is when I talk to our faculty, you know, I, I, you know, I ask him, I ask Peter Erskine, you know, would you ever be interested in something like this? And his reaction is, you know, I do these things all over the country. And it's, gosh, it's too bad, <laughs> you know, that right here, um, that, that it, it hasn't been available. So, uh, you know, so that's one of the things I just tried to make available is what our faculty have to contribute. And they're so supportive. The faculty is so supportive of doing these th kinds of things because they see the, the benefit of it. They see that as, as artist performers, they are called to do these very same kinds of things elsewhere, which also helps them to encourage their own students, the USC students, to really, you know, take a look at this, see what kinds of skills you can get in place right now while you're still a student, because that can make a difference between somebody who's hiring, somebody who has these skills, who can work with community, or somebody who can't. So it, it really is a, a kind of a mutually beneficial thing. We're always making uh, changes based on the needs of the community as well as based on what we have to offer, meaning the students who are available at any given time and what they want to get out of it. Because I always ask them too, you know, we offer these things, are there other experiences that you would be interested in having? Because it's quite possible that we could, we could approach uh, um, su supplying that for you, we just need to know. Um, so things do change. Right now, we cannot grow. <laughs> at all, um, just because we don't have the capacity to. If we um, had more uh, more staff members, if we had you, you know a, a larger organizational structure that could take on more, then we could. Um, because I think that the student uh, the students would. There is more demand from the students than we are able to provide opportunities for them, for the most part. Um, <clears throat> but we can't offer any more unless uh, we had more capacity to do so because we're already like 
<laughs> at at peak, and um, and I'm not even sure that that's that's uh, you know that's that's a different that's a different philosophical issue. Should we or what could we do? That's a different issue. But uh, but w there are enough things going on right now that that I don't anticipate it changing. With the level of change that we have going on at all times, um, it really keeps us on our toes, kind of keeping all the <laughs> all the things you know kind of in control. There are some, some women's shelters that are in our immediate community that we go to. There are some community centers that we go to. And we can absolutely do those kinds of performances as well. Um, we, we initially started with schools <clears throat> just because that's, that's kind of what the call from the community was. Can you come and help us? Can you come? You know, what can you do? What can you do? So. Um, uh, so it, it is entirely possible that we can expand and do more of the nursing home, more of the retirement center, more of the uh, women's shelter kind of kind of situation. Um, we just haven't right now, and that actually, as far as expanding and growing, that's one area that would be just a no-brainer. Um, because I get requests from a lot of those sites as well, I put together. With uh, with some help from people in my program, um, a directory of community sites, and we pulled together information from I don't know there are probably 50 sites listed in there, so that if a student did come and come to me and say you know I'd love to perform in a hospital, particularly with 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 cancer patients, um, so we have information on on the Norris um, um, cancer hospital, that's probably not the right name for it, but on, on that, it, with things that they would naturally need to know. Do you have a piano? Are there stairs? When is the best time for us to perform? What's the best kind of ensemble? Do you need, do you need a flute player or a brass quintet? I mean, so, so we can try to get through some of that initial groundwork so that they're not going to have to keep asking those same questions. So put together that site for students who are motivated to do that so that they can um, take that and, and go and perform. Um, set that up on their own. Um, some faculty members are beginning to advocate for um, having either a pre-recital, <clears throat> even some recitals in, in these off-site locations. Um, we have tremendous demands on our facilities here and sometimes um, you know, doing a performance for a very receptive audience three blocks away would absolutely suit the bill. You know, it, it's a it's a performance opportunity, um, and and some faculty members actually em, em, really embrace that as an opportunity for their students. So yeah, in conjunction, absolutely. And more and more, it's that way. Even, I mean, if you look at um, even performers in in orchestras, orchestras. Uh, largely have a component of a community engagement series or they have performances in schools. And what I hear when I speak to those administrative people is that they, they don't have enough orchestra members who are willing or able to do that kind of work. So then the orchestras very often have to hire other people to do their educational programming. And wouldn't it be nice, wouldn't it be fantastic if somehow they could bring those two together to actually get the members of their very own orchestras you know, get involved in this work? There are all kinds of, there are time issues, there are a million reasons why it can't work, but they would love to find a reason or a way that it could work. So for the, for the orchestral musician, certainly, for, for chamber ensembles or a jazz combo or anything like that, performing on a, on a um, you know, on, if a presenter has hired them to perform a, in a concert series, very often they will ask, you know, well, can you do an additional uh, community engagement performance? In addition to your Saturday night concert, can you go and visit some schools on Thursday and Friday while you're here? For a couple of reasons. I mean, it, it helps um, financially, particularly if there's a smaller presenting organization or if it's a smaller community. If they can partner up with uh, somebody in the school, they can help make that, uh, the, the pay for that ensemble a reality. They can pool their resources and bring a string quartet or a guitar quartet or somebody to an area and, and only further to emphasize the, the, that ensemble's residency in the community. If the kids hear the ensemble during the day, they can go home and say, hey, we need to go hear this ensemble, they're fantastic, to help uh, ticket sales for an evening concert but just to make it a reality. Um, my experience with, with, some, with working for presenting organizations is that if, if there's a series uh, and they have one spot that's open and they want to they wanna have a young ensemble, they want to give a younger ensemble an opportunity, if there's an ensemble that can do some school work and one that can't do some school work, 
they're going to hire the one that does. For their, their, uh, you know, their highlighted series, they'll get that Saturday night concert. But because that ensemble can do the school stuff, they will, they will get the job. So it's not just about who can get the, you know, the prestigious um, chamber ensemble or jazz combo performance on, on Saturday night. It's, it's a step to getting that. And, and honestly, I talk to more and more musicians, professional musicians, not only for simply making a career happen, but actually having some satisfaction in, in what it is. I've spoken to, to various ensembles. I mean, Contus is a, is a vocal ensemble from Minneapolis, and they have a large component of community engagement work. And some of them say that, that without that, the rest of it would just be less interesting. It would be somehow less fulfilling. That it's really a combination of the things that fulfill them as human beings and musically. So it's not, again, just as a means to getting the, getting the good gig. It's actually something that broadens them um, in kind of a humanitarian way, musically um, and ultimately professionally. So, um, the kids in the community, how does this change them? They, I mean, one of the immediate ways, because we are a university, uh, uh, some of our programming goes on here at USC. And for those kids to regularly be coming to USC for programming absolutely makes them realize that it's a place that they could be too. They're here every week. They don't have to stop at the gates and look in. They're here every week for something. And that, I mean, that just comes to mind immediately because we hear so much how, how important that is. Um, for them to have these musical experiences is incredibly valuable for their own education so that they don't see their music performance or their music making as exclusively in their orchestra director's room on Tuesdays and Thursdays from 3 to 4. It's a little bit of a broader thing and to, to help expand that so that, that music making isn't in, in when it's exclusively in schools often it can have the stigma attached that it's something you do in, from K through 12 and as soon as you graduate from high school oh no more need to do that and it kind of helps to demonstrate that it's that it's something that people do in life in general so that their continued lifelong participation in music is role modeled all the time for them so that they can continue to to get the the pleasure and enjoyment and enrichment out of musical experiences I mean, for the kids in the community it's huge for them to have <clears throat> Students at USC who they're working with is unbelievably good for them because, in, for instance, in one of our, our high school jazz bands, those high school students are not so far removed in age from our freshmen and sophomores who very, it's their very first and second year here. So last year um, there was a bass player who, from USC who was giving bass lessons to a high school student from our community who was um, auditioning for uh, music programs. He wanted to go into, he wanted to pursue music. So this student was very well equipped to help him get his audition materials together, what to play, how to audition, how to make sure that when you walk in that room, you can perform your best. Just because you can play very well in your living room doesn't mean that, that, you know, that that will transfer. All of those things that those USC students had just gone through, they know all about it. And, and the student made it in, into several schools, and he had a choice, the space player of, of the schools that he wanted to go to. That would not have been available to him otherwise. It would not have been available. Um, he would not have had the vision of going to school across the country or even auditioning and getting in. So those kinds of opportunities for the, for the kids in the community are huge. Um, for our USC students, um, often, you know, when I first talk to them, sometimes they're, they're a little bit nervous that they're not sure that, that, they ha that they're in a position that they have something to contribute. And oh, how quickly do they <laughs> realize that they do. Um, because it's, it's their idea of what to contribute is at, right at their musical plane. And what these kids need is an understanding that you have to actually put air through the trumpet to get a sound. You know, they're not dealing with the higher issues. They're just dealing with how on earth you get a sound coming out of this thing. And so for our students, I mean, first of all, they get to see that they do have something to contribute musically. And I think, you know, in, in a larger sense, they see that volunteerism and, and contribution can be made in, in small but oh so meaningful ways.
just showing up every Friday at 9 a.m. for their band, you know, for their band rehearsal to help them. Because sometimes they have visions of, boy, what I would have to contribute, you know, some kind of a, a, an overblown sense of what making a contribution to a situation is. And they see very quickly that, that they can make a big impact without even doing anything that is that hard or, you know, it's enjoyable for them. It's not a chore. So they, they get to learn those lessons very quickly. Um, something else that that I see all the time. We have a program called Meet the Instruments where our, our musicians go into elementary um, classrooms and they demonstrate their instrument for, for different class, classes of kids. And, you know, invariably, no matter how the, kind of nervous the musicians are going to play for nine-year-olds, um, they come back with huge smiles on their faces because the, they have made a difference for those kids in the classes. The kids have really loved hearing them play. They've loved hearing them talk about their instruments. And it's, it's such a successful program, and the, and the Thornton students just get so much out of that. They feel needed, they feel useful, and they feel like they have something to contribute. And, and that's a, it's a challenge along the way to pursuit of anything in excellence. You are always having to point to the areas of deficiency. And particularly in, you know, in musical performance or performance in the arts, I mean, you're always pointing to something that's lacking. And when you dwell on that so long, it's, it's really easy to, to lose sight of the larger picture, um, the, what you actually do have to contribute. And so it, it's, it's, you know, it's a tricky thing you know, in the performing arts in general, because it's necessary if you're going to achieve you know, excellence. Um, but they just love doing this. And, then they, you know, and, and that's where they start. They start with a small experience like that, and they have a lot of fun. And then they ask me, how else can I participate? What else can I do? And I truly think it's, it's partly just being useful you know, immediately useful and, and needed. When they do this, this program, Meet the Instruments, um, the idea is that they perform several different pieces of music that are different styles, different techniques. And I often tell our orchestral musicians, this is the perfect place to run through those orchestral excerpts that you have to play for an audition, you know? You have to nail this four times at nine in the morning, you know, for different audiences. And what's best is that you get four opportunities to do this. It's not like you have to wait three weeks to go and do it again. You, like next 15 minutes, you have to go and do it again. Um, because orchestral excerpts are, of course, by definition short, um, and they cover a lot of different styles. So, so absolutely, the, the idea of performing excerpts perfectly, uh, giving them the opportunity to do that, and, and to explore maybe different ways of doing things. So absolutely, musically, they do. And when they take an ensemble to perform in this school, they have to really break down what's going on in that music, in that Haydn string quartet in one of the first movements or whatever movement so that you can actually get the kids inside of it. You have to get inside of it a little bit more to, to be able to open the door and open the window and, and show what's going on in there. And often musicians don't think in, in those terms uh, as far as stepping back and from the listener's perspective what's interesting about this or what are the things that are really uh, you know really compelling about the piece of music often the musicians are concerned about you know gosh that a flats out of tune a lot i you know and and the, the listener isn't particularly concerned about that all the time they're more you know interested in the global you know in, in the music as as a whole our programs the 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 programs themselves are all grant based and so we write grant proposals and we get funding um, in order to provide some compensation for the students for their time. So all the students who go into the community and do this work are paid. They're not going to get rich, <laughs> but they are paid something. Um, and it's a little bit to recognize their time, but also I, I know what it's like. I mean, if, if I had a volunteer situation where I was volunteering to teach a violin class, and, you know, these students are, are attending school. They have living expenses as well. And, and the other thing is that most of our students are working. They're getting paid for their music making in the com community. If somebody called them and said, hey, can you please come and play with my orchestra? I'm going to pay you to do this. Balancing their free violin teaching, you know, I wouldn't blame them for going and doing the orchestra thing to make money. So it's just a little bit... Um, to reward their time as, as well as to, uh, you know, just to, to allow them to make the commitment to do that. So how it starts is, um, in the, it changes every year, but in the fall, um, we have some information meetings for the kinds of opportunities that are available. So students who are interested come to the information meetings, and I run through all the options. You can teach this guitar class at this school at this time on this day. Um, 
and then and then students check what actually works for their schedule because it, just because they're interested in the program doesn't mean that they can't participate if Weems Elementary needs a violin teacher on two thirty you know, 2.30 on Wednesday. If they're not free at that time, they can't do that. So it's, it's really bringing together what they want to do when they are available to do it with what the schools need. So bringing those two things together. We have some training that's involved. We have um, some training days as well as ongoing feedback and training for, the, uh, for however they're participating. And then they, they start whatever job it is they're doing. And then they get feedback along the way. And at the end of each semester for our ongoing music classes, there's some kind of a demonstration event at the end. So they lead their young students in some kind of a demonstration, skills demonstration or something. Um, so that usually ends the semester for our ongoing music classes. Um, so that's, that's roughly how it works. And then they're... You know, they're compensated in different ways depending on what they're doing. If they are standing in front of a class as a teacher, or if they're going to assist a band director. They're very different things. And we're actually able to, to distinguish and define many of the different roles in teaching simply by looking at that, by putting it in action. If you are the person standing in front, what are some of the things you need to consider? Um, creating that structure, reserving the room, setting it up. Are the kids going to be there? Um, are they going to have what they need? Is this early dismissal day but nobody told you? All those kinds of things. Whereas if they're going to help a, mu a music teacher who's there, they're not responsible for any of that. So different levels of responsibility based on what they need and what they want. You know, I'm not sure if I'm in the best perspective, in the position to address that because I deal with it all the time. What, what I see are more and more students who are interested in doing it. Um, and this year, for the very first time, what I saw when I, when I asked you know, the information sessions within, when everybody came together, we have a large amount of graduate students at this school. For the first time, there were a lot of students who came here with experience doing this elsewhere. And that was really fun to see, you know, because then I could talk to them about, well, what have you done? You've done that. Would you like to continue doing that? Would you like to do something else? And, and before, it's really been starting from zero, it feels like, you know? And so I've definitely seen that change. And, and I would assume that that change is also happening at USC. Sometimes I just feel a little too close to it to, to see that. I, what I, one of the things I do see is it's a little bit of an awareness thing. Um, more and more and more and more faculty are interested in their students participating. And they are themselves interested in participating. And it's possibly just because they know about the opportunities more. Um, <clears throat> and and if for, any, for any number of reasons. But we, we have a, a chamber ensemble competition right now that uh, students are, are putting together a, an assembly program for children that will be 35 to 40 minutes long. That's how they enter the competition with a written out program of what they would do in their chamber ensemble or their jazz combo. And more and more faculty people that we have, we have asked to encourage their students, uh, you know, help them if you, know, if you have questions or anything, let us know. And more faculty have, have just so favorably responded and said, this is, this is great. This, I want my students to do this. And then, of course, the dilemma is <clears throat> the students, do they have time? Or, you know, all those kinds of things. And, and it's interesting. Generally, the closer students get toward graduation, the more sense of, uh, of importance this work has on them. And rightfully so. As an undergraduate, you have so many classes and, and so many other things. But people start to kind of realize more and more the closer they get to graduation. Or even better yet, our recent alumni. You know, wow, <laughs> that would have been great if I had done that. You know, and I hear those kinds of you know, those kinds of things from from some of the alumni I run into, and um, they end up doing this kind of work, whether they ever thought they would or not. So it's it's a matter of at the time they're here, um, encouraging them to do it, and and just to to get a little bit of experience because there are plenty of opportunities to do this work once they graduate. There are plenty. Lots of performing organizations in town contact me um, on a regular basis and say, do you have anybody who can come and teach this class for me? Uh, all, the, all the performing organizations in town. Um, do you have anybody who can do this? Because they are just crying for, these, for people who have some experience doing this work so that they can do it for whatever professional organization you know, is, uh, I'm talking to. Yeah, <clears throat> That's a great question. Um, it's, it's a tough question because th this area that I, that I have chosen to pursue, 
falls in a, it's a growing area, but it's new. It's not, a, it's not particularly and exclusively in the performance world, and it's not that way in the music education world. It's walking the line. And, um, and so therefore, often when I go to conferences or I go to different things, um, I don't fit into a box very nicely. You know, it, 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 a lot of you know, music education things, certainly not. And so because of that, it's, it's really, it's hard to tell what will happen, what I, you know, I would like to continue uh, with a component of my own community engagement work. I, I certainly, you know, I, I do my share of performances in communities and, and um, concerts at noon and, and performances for kids and adults and all kinds of settings just because I personally love doing that. I, I must continue doing that. I, I just, I, I get so much pleasure out of doing it that I, that I, I can't see myself stopping that. I really enjoy teaching. And I really enjoy um, teaching uh, and, and kind of showing and opening the doors and at least pr pr being a facilitator for other students who have kind of grown up with a similar kind of um, predetermined definition of success. And to find ways of redefining success for what they are and what they want to facilitate that. Because I think it's only going to lead to um, <laughs> to happier musicians, to musicians who are, who are really fulfilling their own desires in music. And the reach is going to be much fa farther than any one predetermined definition of what success is. That's so limiting. Um, so maybe to help facilitate um, students in, you know, in exploring what, what these, whatever it is for them, and whatever this is. I enjoy doing um, music education research. Um, I would love to do um, some more research projects, some more quantitative research on, on this area and to look at it in comparison to what the more traditional sense of music education is. We, we have a good sense of what works in the teaching and learning um, you know, uh, scenario in schools, but this is a whole different thing in some ways. I'm sure that there are definitely places where there's crossover, but there are places where it's different too, so that we can only reinforce this work to not be reinventing the wheel as far as music education, but also to acknowledge and recognize where it is different, because it's not just the same. So um, those are some, some areas of interest to me. Um, man, some days I really wish I had a crystal ball. <laughs> but then other days it's just along for the ride. So yeah, we'll see. The Midori Center for Community Engagement is a, a research and training center that is uh, committed to the art of community engagement which is actually the first sentence of our mission statement. <laughs> um, it's a center for, to really support musicians in their efforts to engage with different kinds of community. And we're not talking community only as one narrowly defined thing. I mean, it could be the community of other musicians. You know, how people talk about, wouldn't it be great if, for instance, a jazz guitar player actually talked to a classical guitar player? And if a, you know, just like within the music world, and it's not that we have anything against each other, it's just, you know, to, to reach out and see what we can do, you know, so the community of musicians, or a geographic community, or 10-year-olds, um, or reaching out to the 18 through 24-year-old crowd, or community engagement with boards, or a anything like that. <clears throat> so the idea is to provide training and how we might do that to the best of our abilities. Uh, the training center as well as the resource, uh, for the resources to do it. We've started the, um, the Midori Center collection in, this, in the Doheny Library. And it, it's a collection of books, um, of educational materials, advocacy materials, things that, that a person might find helpful if they were to embark on this, uh, you know, on this path. One of the projects that I am most excited about with the, the Community Center for Community Engagement is our documentary series of um, interviewing prominent musicians who are doing this kind of work, like conductors of major symphony orchestras, uh, premier piano soloists, um, people who are really at the top of their game who also do this work. And to ask them, um, I, I've done several of these interviews and videotaped them, and to find out why these people do this work. What do they hope to get out of it? What should we as musicians be doing for community engagement? What shouldn't we be doing? What is it all about? And the series is meant to provide information, but also motivation. <clears throat> Anytime I watch any of these videos, we have 
videos of Leonard Slatkin and and um, well, they're Roa Catria. We have Jean Yves Thibaudet. We have uh, we'll have Yo Yo Ma. We have different musicians, and just to hear them speak, uh, Richard Stoltzman, the passion that he talks about when when he does this work, it is contagious. It is absolutely contagious. And so I think this series really get, gives us an insight into different musicians' um, approaches to their work and to uh, their own musicianship. What does it mean to them to be a musician? And what are they striving for? Um, and it, and it, how did they get into it? So to me, that's one of the most fun parts uh, of it, is, is collecting these things and, and growing that collection so that we can make it available to people.